place in the hearts of all those who are here. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Well, I have to tell you that the children's moments was something that I was really looking forward to because I had this great idea for uh, talking about doubt. And, and, and I was going to ask all the kids, has there been a time in your life when you have doubted the stories of the Bible? And I did finally get around to that. But I didn't have the, the response that I really wanted. Uh, so I'm going to ask you that same question. Has there been a time in your life when you have doubted some of the stories of the Bible? Let me see a show of hands. How about Jonah? Okay, thank you for being honest. Uh, Jonah has always been one of those stories for me. There was a, a difficult one to swallow. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> a little pun. Uh, uh, it has been one of those that has been a little bit rough. And I remember back to a conversation I had with my older brother 40-some years ago. And my, and my older brother was, was one of these people that if there was a way to get in trouble, he found it. And he was always in trouble, always doing things that, you know, you just said, why are you doing these things? Until one day he had a born-again Christian experience. And all of a sudden, this guy that was avoiding all the rules suddenly became this rigid rule keeper. And it was really difficult to be around him. Uh, I wish and I pray that I could have those moments again so that I could be there to surround my brother with the kind of compassion and love that he needed at that moment. But he surrounded himself with very, very strict, literalist, conservative type of Christians who were holding him up and trying to get him out of, the, of his, uh, his problems. And he needed that at that time. But the problem is that when we would have discussions, he went to that very strict, conservative, literal type of, of reply to me. And any time I would have a question, he would say, oh, you don't understand because you're Methodist. Oh, that made me feel really good. Well, there was this one day that, that I, I came to him and I said, you know, and we were having this discussion about the books of the Bible and some of the stories of the Bible. And I said, you know, I have a problem with some of the stories and I have a problem with Jonah and the whale. And he said these words, and I still remember them to this day. He said, if you had a little more faith, you would be able to believe this story. He said, you don't have enough faith. At which point I got very angry with him and walked out. But those words stayed with me even into that night. And I can remember getting down on my hands and knees and, and praying to God, give me more faith. In fact, in Mark, there's this, this wonderful uh, story about a man who, who just can't believe. He says, Lord, help me in my disbelief. And that's why I was saying, help me in my disbelief because you know, my brother accused me of, of cherry-picking the Bible and, and picking those stories that were the easy ones to take and, and to understand and, and leaving the other ones that were too complicated. And so I said, Lord, help me. Help me to, to be able to, 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 to read the Bible in a way where all the stories make sense and all the stories touch me. And, you know, I didn't get an answer to that prayer that night. But it took several years later Several years later when I was in seminary and, and sat down with my, my professor in Old Testament theology and he opened up the story in a way they brought it to life. And I know that there are some of you who probably believe in the story, the literal story, the way you heard it in Sunday school. And that's okay with me. But I would ask that you give me the grace to hear it in a new way today to maybe expand the understanding of Jonah and to, to see that it is a story that can touch the way we live our lives today. So I would ask for that grace as you hear this. This uh, Old Testament uh, professor started with what Meredith did last week. In fact, she stole my uh, children's message uh, last week, and I had it all prepared, and it was going to be what she said to the children last week. So that was one strike against the children's <laughs> moments already. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you remember, if you were here, she said the Bible is like a library. It's like a collection of books and writings. And, and, and said, you know, they're all very different. 
and you start out with the law and with, with history and, and you move on to some of the early prophets and, and then you, you get some of the, the, the writings of what we call wisdom literature and, and you get the Psalms and the Proverbs and all these great things that, and, and they're written in very different ways and you move on to the real prophets, the heavy prophets and then to the lesser prophets and then to, you know, these... Oh, these uh, stories about, like Revelation, the, you know, the, the end of times type of things. And, and then you get, thank goodness, to the gospel message. And, and you get to the, the letters. And, I mean, the Bible is filled with all these different styles of writing. And, and, and the professor said, each one of these styles of writing is blessed and, and inspired by the Holy Spirit. But they are all written for an exact audience to do the maximum amount of good. And so he says, here is what I want you to consider. I want you to consider the book of Jonah as a satire, a complete satire. Now, do you know what a satire is? That's a story that is written with extreme exaggeration to make a point. Usually it's a point that, that breaks a person out of their comfort, a, a, a story that, that is so powerful that you go, it feels like a slap across the face because, you know, it catches your attention. And he says, I want you to consider that the book of Jonah is a satire and was written for the Jewish, uh, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, back in the time, the post-exilic time. So let me unpack that. So... The, the Israelites, if you remember, the Jews are in the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and the Assyrians come and they take it, and they kill a lot of the northern kingdom and they, they take them away. Well, then the southern kingdom finally falls, about 600 B.C. And, and the, they start taking the best and the brightest away, and they take them back to Babylon. And, and then they do it in three waves. And here they are in Babylon, and they're mourning the loss of Jerusalem. And, and, and so, you know, when they finally are released a little over 100 years later, they come back to Jerusalem and they say, we are never going to do this again. We are going to protect ourselves. We are going to be uber obedient, like my brother. We're going to be super obedient. We're going to follow the letter of the law. And we're going to get rid of all those things, those forces out there that were the, the, the outside forces, the Gentile forces. We're going to get rid of our Gentile wives because a lot of them had intermarried. And the families broke up. And we became this cluster of Jews that were just trying to be super obedient so that they never, ever, ever would lose that covenant relationship with God. And so they built what was called the hedge of protection. It wasn't a literal wall. It was a wall, though. It says, we are going to take care of ourselves. We're going to make ourselves great again. We're going to make sure that we build up this wall so that there are no influences from outside. And we're going to make sure that we are in this covenant relationship with God. They understood that they were the chosen people of God. And if you remember the, the words that were given to Abraham so many years ago, it was, you are blessed. And they loved that part. You are blessed. And they didn't want to share that. You are blessed. And what's the rest of that phrase? To be a blessing. You know, that's the hard part. And so he says, so every time you see the word Jonah, then think of the the religious elite, the, the rulers, uh, the, the priests, and, and you think of them. And so Jonah, or the religious power of the day, were told by God to go to Nineveh, a city that was 550 miles to the east. It was a, a Gentile city. It was a, a place where all the heathens gathered. It was Las Vegas in that time. And what was done in Nineveh stayed in Nineveh. Uh, you know, and, and, and they said, you know, I want you to go there and I want you to witness about the love of God. And so what does he do? Instead of going 550 miles to the east, he heads west to Joppa. It's not a, a very long journey. He goes to the, the shore of the Mediterranean Sea and he gets his boat and he gets on it and he heads to Tarshish, which in Hebrew means the end of the world. And so he goes to the east to the end of the world, pure exaggeration. And while he's on this boat, this boat becomes like a little microcosm of the world that was uh, around them at the time. And, and the boat, all the sailors 
are people of different faith. And we understand that because of what happens when the hurricane comes or the typhoon comes or the giant storm comes. And they all start to cry out to their own individual gods. And here they are crying out to their gods. So, you know, all these other lesser gods. And, and where is Jonah? He's asleep down in the hall. Yeah, he, he's asleep, and the word that is used is nave. And, and there's knaves in all of our churches. This is the nave, really. This is where, and the leaders of the church are asleep in the nave where all this, this stuff is happening, where you know, there's turmoil, and, and there's a chance to witness to the people around, and they're all crying out to their gods. And here, the leader of Jerusalem, or the leader of the Jews, are asleep. And, and, and so they bring him up on, on deck, and they say, so who is your God? And he simply says, I am a Hebrew, I worship Yahweh, the, the one who is in heaven, who made the, the water in the, in the earth. And they start to tremble. In fact, they fall down. And, and, and they, they, they start to, to wonder, who is this great God? By just saying, you know, that simple statement, it's an exaggeration. And these people who are supposed to be mean and, and, and non-compassionate, they're supposed to be heathens, they say, so, so what are we going to do for you? Or what are we going to do to you? And, and Jonah says, you need to throw me overboard. And they have enough compassion, enough grace, and enough care that they say, no, we're not going to do that. And they continued to row against the storm, and they ran out of energy, and finally, Jonah says, throw me overboard. And as soon as he hits the water, the storm quiets. And a huge fish, a whale comes up and gobbles him up and goes down into the, the depths of the, the sea for three days. I don't know how many hours have been spent trying to justify how that took place. Uh, uh, how many uh, interpretations, how many commentaries, how many books have been written about how it's possible for a man to be in the, the, way, uh, the belly of a whale for three days and, and come alive again. You know what? That's missing the point. This is a satire. And the point is that when God gives us a mission, when God calls us into action, God is not going to stop calling us until we do it. Uh, God is going to give us one chance, two chances, three chances. God is a God of many chances. And so here is Jonah, and he he's, gets spit up. I love the word. He gets vomited onto the, the beach, and here he is just coated, uh, you know, it, it's satire. He's, uh, he's coded and, and he's on the very beach where he left. And, and instead of being glad that he, was, that he was saved, he's angry. Because now he has to go back to Nineveh. And so I can see this guy, you know, smelly, uh, going back to Nineveh. All 550 miles begrudgingly. And he gets to Nineveh, and Nineveh is this walled city. There's supposed to be 120,000 men. I don't know how many women, but 120,000 men there. And he, the city is a walled city, and it says that he walked from one side of the city, and it took him three days. Well, he was a good walker. If he did 100, or 550 miles, he's probably a good walker. And, 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 you know, so I'm going to say that, let's say he just covered 10 miles a day, which would be easy for him. And if you say that he did three days of walking, that means it's probably got a, a, a diameter of, oh, 30 miles. Well, if you put a pin drop in the middle of Portland and you, and you said, okay, where's 15 miles up? That's about to the I-5 and 205 uh, juncture there in Salmon Creek. And, and about 15 miles to the south, that would be about the same I-5 and 205. And so here is Jonah walking through a city, you know, back and forth, you know, all that area. And, and all he's saying is the, the Lord is upset and wants you to repent. And God is going to destroy this city in 40 days unless you do so. 
That's not a very great message. You know, and, and it's one of those messages that probably get you booted out. I would like for you to think that you're up, you know, at Legacy Hospital and you're starting to walk all the way down through Hazeldale and down into Vancouver and then across the bridge. And that's all you're saying is, you know, in 40 days, Vancouver and Portland are going to be destroyed unless you repent. How, how many people do you think would do it? Yeah, zero. It wouldn't. And yet... This story says that from the very first person, the one who met him at the gate, the one who allowed him in, and as he's going through the city, every person immediately, immediately stopped what they were doing, repented, took off their clothes, and put on sackcloth. That's, that's burlap. It's itchy, terrible stuff. And, and, and then began a three-day fast. Think that's possible? Exaggeration. Exaggeration to make a point. And the point is this. That as God looked down and saw what had changed, saw that this city that was known for its sin had changed, then God changed God's mind and said, I'm not going to destroy this city. And listen to Jonah's response. And consider this to be the response of the religious elite of the time. Angered, he said to God, this is why I didn't want to go on the mission in the first place. I knew you were going to be tender, compassionate, slow to show anger, and faithful in your love. Wow. Isn't that what we want God to be? Isn't that we hope what God would be? And here is Jonah representing the religious elite saying that's exactly why I don't want to reach out to those around us. I want to keep this to myself. I want to keep this blessing to myself so that it isn't shared with anyone else. Oh, it's amazing when you unleash the story from its literalness. It starts to preach, doesn't it? It allows you to, to really get into the story. Now, just in case you didn't get it, and, and I'm sure that, that Jonah and, the, and the, the religious elite didn't get it the first time through. So he tells the rest of the story. And it's like another slap in the face to make sure that people got it. So Jonah is, is there and he's waiting for, the, uh, for this plague or whatever, whatever is going to happen to destroy Nineveh. And so he says, I know this God's still going to hold out. I know he's going to do it. I know that these are evil people. I want them to be destroyed. And so he goes up on a hillside. For 40 days, he's up there on this hillside waiting, getting the front row seat to this destruction. And while he's there, God grows this plant next to him. It's a big old castor oil plant. And it's got this big leaf, and it creates this beautiful shade. And while he's up there, he's enjoying his comfort and on the 40th day, when, when he says, okay, here comes the destruction, instead of destroying the city of Nineveh, God destroys the plant. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's, it's just so... And, and he is angry. Now listen to this. And once again, Jonah was livid, and he screamed to God, I might as well be dead than go on living. And God responded, are you serious? What right do you have to be angry at a plant dying? And Jonah persisted in his indignation. And even though he looked foolish, I have every right to be angry, mortally angry. Can you imagine that? those words spoken by the leaders of, of Israel at the time? And then God replied, you are more concerned about the plant than you are of 120,000 people who don't know their right from their left. He says, that's what I sent you out there for. I sent you out there to witness. I sent you out there to care for these people. I sent you out there to, to bring my rule, my law, my love to them. And you care more about your comfort than you do about those 120,000 people. Wow. All of a sudden, the story becomes real, doesn't it? I mean, it is a story that applies to us today. It is so easy to, to come every Sunday and, and hear the words, you are the beloved child of God. And that's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's so great to be able to hear that we are blessed and we love that blessing. But we forget sometimes that we are supposed to be blessed to be a blessing to those around us. It's easy to, 
to be in comfort and to be in the nave of the church, to be, to be here and to, to say, oh, this feels so good. But what we are called to do is to take what we have here and go out into the world and change the world. It's easy to understand that, that each of us have been, our sins have been forgiven by our Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ says, I did that so that you would be transformed, so that you would look more and more like me, so that you could transform the world around you. That's when it gets hard. And that's what this story is about. It's about coming out of our comfort zone, coming out of the, the nave of the church, coming out of our, you know, being in that shade and going out into the rough world and proclaiming Christ's love to the world. My Old Testament professor ended that class with these words. He says, there is a Jonah in each of us. Jonah lurks in every Christian heart, whispering his insid insidious message of smug prejudice, empty traditionalism, and hateful exclusivity. We grasp the message of this book only when we eliminate the Jonah within us. As the great fish coughed up Jonah on the beach, so too must we eject from within us any prejudice and narrow judgment that prevents us from sharing God's blessing with a love-starved world. Isn't that beautiful? All of a sudden, the book of Jonah comes alive. It comes alive in a way that can change our lives and the way we respond to others. It's powerful. This ancient book that is overlooked, this ancient book that has held so many people hostage for so long, this ancient book becomes more than just a tale we tell our children in Sunday school. It becomes something that applies to the way we live our lives today. And I love the fact that it just ended with a slap in the face and saying, now go and do. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.